This government meeting is brought to you by Eastworks and our local cable subscribers. Ready? Ready. Good evening. Welcome to the Hampton City Council meeting for Wednesday, June 7th. The meeting tonight is being recorded and broadcast by eMedia on Charter Channel 193 or live streaming of their channel, eMedia website. All council and participating in this meeting are gathering hybrid of the executive order by governor extended to March 2025, which allow, allow us to do so. I remind both the member of the city council and the public to remain mute until recognized by the city council president. Also, for the members of the public, please remove your camera for the duration of the meeting unless you are participating in public speak time or public hearing. Thank you. This meeting is now called to order. Marianne. Connie Denham. Here. Salem Derby. Present. Omar Gomez. Here. J.P. Kwasinski. Here. David Munier. Here. Tom Peak. Here. Brad Riley. Here. Dan Rist. Here. Owen Zaret. Present. Thank you. Please stand up for the Pledge of the Legions. To the Legion, to the flag, the United States of America, and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We don't have any minutes today to approve. We will have those minutes as soon as possible. Police speak time. This is the opportunity for the public to address any concerns regarding any topic is not listed under the public hearing. If you have anything to say to the, to the city council, now is the time to go to the podium, state your name and address. We're gonna give you three minutes. And the people who are remote, please raise your digital hand <laughs> and we're gonna allow you to participate. Anyone from the public? I don't see any. Communication from elected officials, boards, and committee. Any councilor have anything for tonight? See none. Mayor's communication, Madam Mayor. None. Thank you, Mayor. Corresponding announcement for the president and vice president. Mr. Vice President? Uh, no, Mr. President. And I don't have any either. <laughs> Report for standing committees. Finance, Council Arrest. Thank you, Mr. President. Other than what's on the agenda tonight, the budget, the Finance Committee will meet on June 14th. That's next Wednesday at 515. Uh, it'll be a hybrid meeting uh, down in room one at 515 uh, to discuss the new business that will be sent to the committee this evening. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Council Arrest. Council Sarit, Police Safety. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, we met recently to discuss a number of items on our agenda. Um, regarding a few items, we determined that at this time we do not need them on the agenda, but we can certainly reintroduce them at a, a further point. Uh, these are the request to review the safety of the south sidewalk at South Street at Main Street intersection, the South Main four-way traffic light, and the review of electronic uh, speed monitoring signs. Uh, just to really quickly touch on the traffic light uh, at South and Main Street. Um, as many people know, this is a relatively dangerous intersection. In the last 20 years, there have been 70 accidents there. Um, there is good data uh, from the Northampton and West Street intersection, which had similar high accident rates that putting a light would probably decrease accidents there. Um, it's costly, probably somewhere $1.25 million. I don't know the exact number, um, but at this time, it's certainly not something we're prepared to do. Uh, furthermore, the traffic counts, uh, when we last had comment from DOT, which was a few years back, I believe were just barely enough to warrant a traffic light, and the most recent traffic counts at that intersection are actually lower, surprisingly, with the new school. Um, so uh, I know that there was a lot of interest in this. We had a couple of counselors uh, who were advocating for this, including myself, and we had significant public engagement with a change.org petition that gained, I think, close to 1,300 signatures. 
So I think we can all agree that this area is unsafe and still warrants uh, attention. Um, but at this time, we would like to remove that. I'll make a motion a second for that. Um, so, uh, um, but uh, there's a letter that I forgot to submit, but I'll, I'll send that just for information to the packet next time, Mr. President. So at this time, um, I'd like to make a motion to remove without prejudice uh, the uh, request to review the safety of the sidewalk at South Main uh, and the South Main four-way traffic light. Use those two. I'm going to mention. I'm going to talk okay. about the other one. Sorry. Second. We have a motion and a second to uh, remove without prejudice the request of the review of safety of the sidewalks on South Street and Main Street intersection and the review of the South and Main Street four-way traffic light. Any further discussion? Seeing none. Those, those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Uh, Sanctions? Seeing none. Motion passed. Councilor oh. Zarek. Thank you, Mr. President. I'm also buying time until 6.15. Um, yeah, please. <laughs> Four score and seven years ago. Oh, regarding the uh, the electric speed monitoring signs, that there was we had a uh, discussion both with uh, uh, police and DPW. I think it was agreed upon that these could be helpful. There's good studies out there showing that these do mitigate speed, and some of the ones we looked at are cloud-based, so they can actually facilitate uh, public safety in terms of uh, determining traffic counts, whether that be for planning projects, but also for uh, traffic mitigation and enforcement. Mm -hmm. um, at this time, there's, I think we've basically exhausted that conversation, um, but I do feel that it that they it would be warranted. Obviously, they come at a cost. I think all the information is in the hands of um, both DPW and, and public safety at this time, but again, we can always bring it back if we need to. So um, at this time, I'd like to make a motion to remove without prejudice the review use of electric speed monitoring signs. Second. I have a motion and a second to remove without prejudice the review of use the electric speed monitor signs. Any further discussion? See no. Does those one in favor? Aye. 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 Any against? Abstentions? See no. Motion passes. And then uh, regarding, uh, we did discuss the uh, Mountain View School driveway about what would be an appropriate speed limit there. I've reached out to both police and DBW and got some good answers. Um, and we'll be discussing that at our next meeting, which is scheduled for June 22nd. That's a Thursday at 6 p.m. Next, extend two items that we have the agenda. Yes. One thank will you. expire before the 21st, but on the 21st, oh. is, uh, we don't know if we're going to have the full agenda with the reports. In case we do not, we should extend it. Um, in case we don't have reports on yeah. the 21st. Uh, are you, are you, We're talking about the ordinance review yeah, committee thank you, Mr. President. and the Mount Tom trailhead and East Street safety issues. Yes, 90 days for both of those. Thank you for your attention to that. Second. We have a motion and a second to extend those two items for 90, day, uh, for 90 days. Any further discussion? See none. For those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Objections. See no motion passes. So once again, we're meeting on the 22nd at 6 p.m. Um, and uh, thus concludes. Thank you. Still got seven minutes. Okay. Would I have any appointments, Councilor Riley? Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Um, so yes, there was no business before the appointment committee since the last time uh, we've met here at uh, the full council. Um, <clears throat> we will, however, have new business. Um, coming to the committee. So there will be uh, an appointment committee meeting on uh, June 15th in conference room two, which is this room right here behind uh, city council chambers. Um, and I would also like to invite any city councilors who would like to come. Uh, we will be uh, taking a look at the um, appointment of the principal assessor um, for the city of East Hampton. So uh, all input is uh, valued and uh, I look forward to anybody that can attend. It's the 15th you said? Yes, June June 15th at 6 p.m. And that concludes? Yes, that, that concludes. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Ordinance, Councillor Derby. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Ordinance Committee met last night um, and we did have a chance to um, review the changes that the city solicitor made to um, the safe and fair access to legally protective, uh, reproductive and gender affirming healthcare services. Um, and so we were able to not only discuss the changes that he suggested, accept the changes, 
Um, we also uh, voted to bring that to the full council. Um, so at this time, I would like to uh, set a public hearing for that item for July 5th in these chambers. Second. We, I have a motion and a second to schedule a public hearing July 5th at 6 15 at this chamber about the safe and fair access to legal eye protect reproductive and gender affirmative. Any further discussion? See you no. Know, those, those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Yeptions? See you none. Know, motion passes. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, <clears throat> so we have a couple of items that are going to be part of the public hearing tonight. So I will um, leave those off. I do. We do have a joint public hearing with the planning board on, uh, let me just make sure I get this right, I believe, yep, on the 20th of June um, at 6.15. Uh, and at that meeting, the ordinance committee and the planning board will converge to discuss um, allowing for a municipal exemption to the Electronic Messaging Center ordinance, which if anybody remembers, uh, at this moment are only allowed in the Mill Industrial District for buildings that have over 100,000 square feet. Um, considering the, the kind of uh, pre prevalence of those signs and innoc they're innocuous, um, I th you know, we're gonna be looking at um, changing that piece of the ordinance so if for example the fire department which I believe was looking at a grant to get assigned to display public information at the fire station they would be able to do that um, so that is something that we will be discussing with the planning board um, and our next meeting is going to be not well it will be the planning board joint public hearing but mm -hmm. after that we have one on the 21st at 5 30 uh, where we'll be discussing some of our uh, new business that we're going to be receiving tonight. It's just going to be a quick introductory meeting, um, and it will be uh, right before our 21st meeting. And that's all I have, and we still have three minutes. Yes. Sorry, thus concludes. <laughs> Thank you, Councilor Derby. I tried to talk really slow. Property, Thank Councilor you. Kuczynski. Well, Mr. President, with a clear docket, uh, I'm sorry to say you have no report. Use, use a few minutes. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. Councillor Rist, rules. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, Councillor Zaret has graciously uh, asked if he could take up the resolution against anti-Semitism in his public safety committee, and I welcome that. Councillor Denham and myself has, has had, and we're both on the rules committee, 11 city council related meetings and finance meetings in May. So we're kind of burnt a little bit and I don't want to make short rift of a very important resolution so I welcome the fact that uh, Councilor Zare is willing to take up this and I'll make a motion anti-semitism is a public safety issue after all so it's not out of the question that it could be in that committee so I move that the resolution against anti-semitism be moved from the rules and government relations committee and sent to the public safety committee for review second, second. We have, I have a motion and a second to move the resolution to police safety. Any further discussion? Seeing none, for those in favor? Aye. Aye. Anyone against? Yeptions? Seeing none. Motion passes. That concludes. Thank you, Councilor Rest. We have two minutes. Come on. <laughs> um, let's move. Going to do the, um, the appointments. appointments. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. Uh, I would like to move uh, the City Council appointment of Principal Assessor to the Appointments Committee. Second. Second. We have a motion and a second to move the City Council appointment the Principal Assessor to the Appointments Committee. Any further discussion? You know, for those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Objections? Seeing none. Motion passes. Uh, and I would also like to move the uh, two new uh, mayoral appointments uh, for um, Martha, oh, I'm sorry, uh, Sean Abbott to the Bees Committee with the term expiration of 12-31-2025 and James Haas to the um, COD uh, to 12-31-2023 to the Appointments Committee. Second. Sorry. I have a motion and a second to move the two new mayoral appointment to the uh, appointments committee. Any further discussion? 
Seeing none, for, the, this, for those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Exceptions? Seeing none, motion passes. Mr. President, 615. All right, yes. Will the public hearings be open? Second. Second. I have a motion and a second to open a public hearing. Any further discussion? Aye. Aye. Seeing none, for those. <laughs> not yet. <laughs> for those who are in favor. further discussion. <laughs> but I think we should do it. For those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against objections? <laughs> <laughs> no motion passes. Councillor Rist. Thank you, Mr. President. Tonight we are required to put the city's $52 million budget uh, and approve it. The Finance Committee reviewed the budget as always, line by line. The mayor requested departments not show any layoffs <coughs> this year and a 3% increase in expense lines. The departments did comply with this request. Most of the budget increase that you will see are due to salary increases to pay plan employees and collective bargaining increases for our unions. With high inflation and a property tax limitation to 2.5%, this makes budgeting difficult, but we believe it has been successfully done that services can be continued. The amended balanced budget found on page 14 shows revised figures from the Finance Committee's extensive review where mathematical errors and typos were discovered. This resulted in a minor increase in the budgeted expenses to $52,302,611.13. As it has to be budgeted, the subsequent revenue change was made by using the recent Senate's aid to cities and towns budget and not the governor's figure. It should be noted that revenue is always an estimate as it is conservatively based on what was collected locally last fiscal year and the state's budget, which is rarely passed in time for local budgets to be set. They still haven't passed it. Um, included in the revenue estimate is the use of 400000 in tax rate stabilization funds, which was established using our extensive free cash, which is un unlikely to ever be that high again. This is a give back to the taxpayers, given the voted cost of two new high schools. The financial picture of our city is excellent, and I rate it A+. Plus and I've been here a while. We are in great position with regard to our savings and our stabilization. We have high figures in our stabilization accounts and those savings are a hedge against any drop in state aid due to any future recession. This is a testament to the fine work of the mayor and her financial team and I applaud them. We are in good shape. The budget increased from 48,541,883 last fiscal year to $52,302,611.13, or $3.76 million increase, or 7.5%. Mr. President, I will move through each of the 10 budget sections one by one so that we can vote on them separately and hear public comment separately, if that pleases yep. the President. The first up is general government. Uh, just a couple of overlu includes many departments. In general government is the mayor's office, city council, planning, treasurer, auditor, human resources, assessor's office, licensing, information technology, collections, elections, building operations. Some of the highlights, most of the increases, very welcome for this council, were due to pay plan changes with new job descriptions, grades, and salary scale. That is salary increases for our pay plan employees. We voted those changes in recently. Um, the mayor's office adds one part-time grant-funded clerk. Building operations adds a second full-time building custodian. Also, more preventative maintenance for building operations will be done because we haven't been doing that, and it's costly when we wait until something breaks. The assessor's salary increased to be more competitive in that line, and the planning department is working very hard to move grant-funded positions in their department into the general fund for future budgets. Those are the most of the uh, highlights that I have. I think some of our department heads are here if counselors have questions. Any counselors have any questions? No? Anyone from the public have any questions or comment about Section 1 general government or comments? Seeing none, council arrest. Okay. <clears throat> I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $2,872,205.10 for the various departments listed under Section 1 general government. 
and that the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations with the following amounts to be transferred as recommended by the mayor and the city council finance committee. Water sewer enterprise, $243,895.80. Parking fund, $2,500. Cannabis stabilization, $23,000. AR ARPA funds, $52,289.12 an ECA donation, $2,900. Second. I have a motion and a second to approve the Section 1 general government for $2,872,205 with 10 cents. Any further discussion? Say no. For those, those one in favor? Aye. 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 Anyone against? Exceptions? See none. Motion passes. Council arrest. Public safety. This includes the police and fire departments, dispatch, and inspections. Majority of increases in these, all of these departments are due to collective bargaining union increases. Overtime is level funded. The police department is very busy with the loss of specials, which are part-time officers that used to fill in, which created the need for overtime for the first time this year. Um, the use, the police department is very happy with the use of mental health clinicians, which they found very helpful in response to those situations. The fire department ambulance has, has a new West Hampton contract with an increase from 25,000 to 40,000 as part of the contract and a new cardiac monitor, which cost, I think something like $30,000 as part of the deal. The chief indicated that the West Hampton service does add increased revenue to the general fund and has not hampered services to East Hampton. Dispatch and inspections were funded and there were no uh, questions there. Any council have any questions or comments? See none. Uh, any of the department heads have something to add? Fire chief, police chief? No? Anyone from the public have any comments or questions about this section? No one here. Shelby? Hi, I'm Shelby Lee. I'm a resident from Ward 3. Um, I know this will probably fall on deaf ears, but I really encourage the counselors to think critically before passing the budget for the EPD. The past two years that the department has been required to provide data on racial bias has shown that there is significant bias. The percentage of BIPOC people that they interact with is significantly higher than is represented in our population, yet they rubber stamp themselves in spite of that very clear report saying that they are not biased when the data proves otherwise. Alberti also likes to threaten the public with vague statements about inability to respond if their budget is cut, but their data shows that they almost exclusively deal with private property calls. He says a cut to the budget would result in a loss of staff, and honestly, they should lose some people. When you pull the police reports and use of force reports, there's a clear pattern of officers who are far more likely to engage in unnecessary and over-the-top use of force with members of our community. This community desperately needs services that are not provided by an oppressive-based bias system. Marginalized groups have been raising this concern for years and proving that a better way is possible and there's tons of available data on this. I encourage you to really think critically about the statement you are making to the people most victimized by police in our community by passing their budget forward. Thank you. Thank you, Shelby. Anyone else? Seeing none, Council Arrest. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $7,382,696.44 for the various departments listed under Section 2 Public Safety, and that the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations as recommended by the mayor and the City Council Finance Committee. Second. I have a motion and a second for the Section 2 Police Safety of the amount of $7,300,000. $382,696 with 44 cents. Any further discussion? Seeing none, for those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? <clears throat> Abstentions? Seeing none, motion passes. Council arrest. In the education department, I'd like to report that 
I positively feel good about the communication between the mayor's office and the school department led to the approval of the mayor's budget by the schools committee. The $18.433 million budget represented an increase of $1.735 million. The city also supports school insurance needs among many other items, resulting in approximately a $24 million budgeted amount. Overall, the finance committee found this very positive. A uh, couple of notes though. All pandemic grant funded positions in the schools will be absorbed into the budget over time with the hope of not having to lay off any staff. This is important as many positions are currently funded by federal pandemic grants, which run out, I believe, in fiscal year 25. The English language learners program was heavily discussed as the cut to this program is very concerning to President Gomez and sub sub subsequently to the entire committee. Although the council normally does not get into the details of the school programming, as that is the purview of the elected school committee, this program affects the entire community, especially the BIPOC community. Although the superintendent defended the reduction because data suggested very good results from the program, it is the opinion of the finance committee that a drop in the available staff could result in a less than desirable success rate. As a result of this conversation, the committee does not have a recommendation for the school budget pending negotiations on the English language learners program. I would like to turn it over to President Gomez who has more information on these negotiations. Thank you, Councilor Rest. We did sit down with the finance uh, committee from the school committee and we have uh, a long discussion about the year program. Um, this council is gonna say yes tonight based on the conversation and a kind of agreement that we have with the school committee, especially with the finance committee. Um, and I feel comfortable that the school department is going to do what is right for the EL program. Um, based on that, I'm, I'm okay voting for, for the budget. Any other counselor? I wanna, yeah. what then, or you want to talk? No. Any counselor? Counselor Sarek. So I'm inferring that the schools have some sort of plan to. Yes, and, uh, and a school. Yes, I'm waiting for Mr. Goldstein that he's going to say something now. Okay. Yeah. Mr. Goldstein? Hi, good evening, council members. Um, so, yeah, if I. Is it. Is now the moment to read a statement? Please. Uh, about what we discussed? Okay, so good evening and thank you very much for the opportunity to speak on the school budget before you tonight. I would like to start with a reminder of the school budget process because I think it's important in the overall view of the conversation tonight. Our veteran leadership team who have extensive educational backgrounds began this process over six months ago. At the time, they used the projected enrollment numbers and multiple other informed but not finalized data points to generate the anticipated programmatic and budgetary needs of the district. In addition, there are many moving parts to the budget as it includes funding from federal, state, city, and other foundation sources, not all of which are firmly set at the early stages of the budget. All that said, I've been impressed each year with how close our administrators are able to determine the city funding request. In February, our finance subcommittee works closely with the superintendent and business director to finalize the budget. We review every line of the budget and discuss the implica implications to each of our academic programs and the needs of our students. We discuss the opportunities of smaller class sizes, choice in and choice out students, the growing trends of vocational schools, and much more. During our turn, the budget often goes through two to three revisions before it is finalized and brought to the entire school committee for review and approval in March. Since March, the budget has been reviewed by the mayor's office and most recently the city council finance subcommittee. While, ad, while our administrators continue to prepare for the next year and during summer right now, when anticipated enrollment numbers are updated, the leadership team makes the necessary programmatic changes, including staffing to fit the needs of our students and maintain state requirements in SPED, English language learners and other programs. This year, Based on the feedback from the ELL program staff, along with the fact that we have a new superintendent coming on board in July, 
the school committee agreed to have additional presentation and review of the ELL program. The presentation for anticipated fall enrollment uh, was postponed, um, but will be next week on Tuesday, June 13th, and a follow-up program presentation specific to the ELL by staff will happen on July 31st. At this meeting, the school committee members in consultation with the directors of the ELL program will review the facts and student needs to make a recommendation to the new superintendent. In the meantime, and based on the enrollment of the ELL program across the three sections, which are pre-K through four, five through eight, and nine through 12, the district recognizes that some adjustments from our program planning recognizes some adjustments are necessary from our program planning established in January. Therefore, we are committed to funding a paraeducator at the K through four grade level in the ELL program for FY 2024. Student needs at this level warrant a teacher and paraeducator to support these youngest of learners in our district as they integrate their English language learning into their academic career. At the fifth through eighth grade level, we understand that student needs and the amount of support services has dropped significantly. There we're, therefore, we will wait to hear more from program staff and the administrators in our July 31st meeting before we come to any conclusions. And finally, at the high school level, we look forward to learning more about the services this position offers and the needs of our high school students as they prepare to move on to, into their professional career, again, before we make any final decisions. Um, therefore, overall, we want to thank the mayor and the city council for the full funding of our school budget, uh, school district budget in the amount of $18,833,400. Thank you very much. If you have any other questions, I'm free, free to answer anything. Any council have any questions to Mr. Goldstein? No? Anyone from the public have any questions or comments? Megan. Hi, all. Um, thank you for uh, discussing this tonight and for letting us join, the, join uh, virtually. I want to thank the school committee and uh, our community and the mayor and the finance director um, and Dr. LeClaire and the curriculum director and more people than we can name. And I'll, I'll be forgetting people, but there's been a lot of work that has gone into budget planning in the past um, two years that I have been a member of the school committee um, and some really close communication between city council and school committee and the mayor. Um, and I, I want to say we find ourselves in a lovely place in the city um, in regard to the budget, but we don't find ourselves in it. We have worked really hard. Um, many people have worked really hard to come to this point where we are talking about um, growth in services, um, not just level services and really um, putting our, our kids first. So I want to thank everyone who's been involved in that. Um, we were happy to meet with city council uh, last week, two weeks ago. Time is time is funny. Last week, I believe it was um, to discuss concerns related to the English language learning program. Um, and I just wanted to reassure counselors and the community that is watching that this the school committee um, for the entire duration that I have been on it and uh, that I have uh, watched as a parent in this community has been committed to uh, making sure that there are level services uh, and Dr. LeClaire and the administration um, and level services at minimum um, and have done that in some challenging, really challenging situations. Um, so I just wanted to point out that uh, this um, upcoming public discussion of the English language learning program um, was scheduled um, even before we met with city councilors. Um, I just say that to reassure, you know, everybody involved in the community that um, this is something the school committee does always. We are always um, thinking about this, hearing from constituents, um, addressing concerns. It doesn't necessarily mean that um, any one particular decision will be made, but we have all of the facts presented uh, in the public. And as um, Marin just explained, um, you know, we're we're absolutely committed to making sure that all of our students have exactly what they need next year. 
Um, so I just want to close and, and just say thank you. Um, thank you for passing the budget forward. Thank you for funding our schools. And thank you for the team for working hard on this. Thank you, Megan. Anyone else? So, you know, I want to make a last statement and then I will pass it to other counselors if they want to say something else. Um, primero, yo quiero decir que para mí es sumamente importante este programa porque afecta a muchos de los estudiantes que hablan el idioma que yo estoy hablando ahora mismo y que no tienen ni idea de cómo hablar inglés. Eh, así que es muy importante mandar el mensaje que nuestra comunidad necesita para que vengan y los que estén aquí se queden en, este, en esta ciudad. Jamás pedimos que ningún programa se cortara para crear el fondo para el y él. Esa no fue la idea. Um, I'm gonna say in English. There was a lot of confusion here, right? A lot of faces really confused what I was saying. It's really hard to understand. It's really hard to speak another language and not understand the language that someone is speaking. So EL is really important. And the message that we have to send, not just for our community, but for our future neighbors, is that this community is welcome. They are welcome to come here. That we're going to help them to succeed. Because we have programs to make them succeed. Our, our intent from Councilor Denham, and I will talk for, for her just a bit, was never to get money from any other department to fund the EL program. Never that was the intent. There was a few rumors out there, and I want to clarify all the rumors. One. Yes, we talked to teachers, because the teacher reached to us. And what we're supposed to do, people vote for us to respond to everybody. And that's what we did. We listen to teachers. We respect the administrators. We do. We know that they're hard, they work really hard working on the budget. But we, but we listen to the other side, too. There was a lot of concern from teachers, para educators, and we sit down with them. And after listen their presentation and seeing it, we can the the, in the conclusion that we need to support the teachers. And not just because they EL. If any of the teachers or any city employees or anyone in the city need any support, and I will talk for the full council, contact us. Because I'm, I'm more than that sure that the counselors are willing to listen to them and work with them for the benefit of everybody. Just want to make that clear. We did what we're supposed to do. We don't wait. We just listen and we take actions. Any other counselors? Councilor Denham. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. President. I uh, first want to thank the school committee for, I think, a, a very uh, honest, I think, heartfelt conversation in terms of what we think the needs of ELL students are. Um, and um, as I was kind of engaged in this conversation and listening to people's thoughts and the overall kind of process that an ELL student goes through in terms of this program, something kind of stood out. And uh, after much reflection and thinking about it, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't understand why it, um, why it was so stuck, right? I was very stuck. And, and part of the process, as I understand it, is that as students go through this process, right, and their English improves, they're services are removed right and and the idea or the 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 goal is that uh these students will kind of leave and and be on their own and be successful right and 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 if they struggle they have the opportunity to come back but the, but the goal is is they kind of they get out there and they and they try and i work with college students um, and I have to say, of, uh, I work in student success, and 
the students that I work with by and large, or the students that come to me and interact with me, are the students who know how to advocate for themselves, right? These students often come from privilege. These students often have parents who guide them and tell them what to go and do and who to speak to. These are students who don't accept no for an answer, right? They come back, they email you, it is, they are relentless, right? And, and good on them, right? And when I, when I, when I sat there and I, I reflected on this idea that these students, you know, they have to, they have to move on, I, I was struck by the fact that historically what we do for members of the BIPOC community and members of low income and other minoritized populations, what we do is we, we give them just enough. And that is our great failure. Because what we say within a program of just enough is actually not enough, right? Those students need ongoing support. They need ongoing mentorship. They need a whole battery of, of resources to be able to help them be successful. But that mentality of just enough is something that becomes ingrained in them. That is something that they learn. That is something that when they have the opportunity of going to college, they don't ask for help because they don't think they're supposed to because I have what I need. And that actually isn't enough because those students actually end up without the resources or the, the, the belief in self or the self-advocacy to be able to go and to find those resources. And when they do find those resources, it's often because they stumbled upon upon it. Uh, they may have had a faculty member or they may have had a friend that said, hey, you should go and do that. But that isn't necessarily something that was uh, uh, learned from the outset. And that learning begins here, right? That idea and that learning that I deserve more and that I should have more is, is just not a mentality that a lot of students have because they think that this is what I get and this is what I should have when other students demand much, much more. And I also wanna say that that idea, that mentality, that perception, however you wanna phrase that, becomes generational. Because you have students who go to college, who have parents who are, are they're the first in their family to go to college, they don't have those resources. And what we are advocating for as, this, as a council is to break that cycle to give those students more than what they need. And it doesn't matter what the program says in terms of how many students that teacher is supposed to have, create additional resources for those students to continue to work with those individuals. We have the resources, we have the funds, because we are saying that if that doesn't work and that's not enough, then come back to us for an appropriation, right? We want, we want to see those students successful, right? And I think that, that this idea of of students having just enough, we need, to, we need to remove that, right? Students need a whole lot more um, to be successful. We live in a very complicated and challenging world today, and we need to be doing everything that we can to provide all, not just all students, but particularly those that are the most vulnerable. And in, in my opinion, as someone who has taught English as a second language, uh, that student, uh, that support is is all the more important in the in the type of environment that we live in today. Thank you, Councillor. Any other Councillor, Councillor Riley? Um, <clears throat> so you know, before I kind of you know give my remarks here, I'm under no illusion how difficult the budgeting process is. I get it. I know that there is a finite amount of money to fund the entire city. And I know that there are always going to be cuts to certain programs or to certain areas of our government when the need arises. So I get that. And this is of no disrespect to all of the people that have put their energy and efforts into creating this budget. So I have an immense amount of respect for that. What I need to do though, is I need to tell you a little bit about my story. Um, so I grew up in the early 80s with a single mother 
who had a seventh grade education in a rural part of Vermont on the Canadian border where I was only, ex I was only exposed to broken English until the time that I entered the public school system. I did not have TV that had uh, channels in English. I did not have radio stations with musicians that sang in English. I grew up essentially blind in a world around me, not understanding anything that was going on except for the language that my mother gave me, which was barely enough to make sense of the world. Coupled on top of that, I was born with a cleft palate, and when I was 18 months old, I had to have reconstructive surgery on my mouth so in addition to this language barrier of being surrounded uh, by Francophone culture, I also had a physical disability that made it exponentially difficult for me to learn how to talk. I had to fight like hell my entire life to learn how to be in a space where I can sit at a table like this. And I am an exception to the rule. Right? Just because I made it doesn't mean that that's enough to say, well, if Councillor Riley can become what he is today, then everybody can. That's not true. So where I struggle with this is that we are now at the end of this process and we are basically saying that there's a good faith effort that we may fully fund these types of programs for these students. So what kind of a message does that say to these kids that are in these schools? There are people in our schools right now that look and grew up exactly like Council President Gomez. He also had to fight like hell to learn how to exist in the world that we live in right now. And it's hard. It's so hard when you cannot communicate the things that are inside you to the people who are outside of you and when you cannot understand the things that people are saying to you. It's isolating, it's lonely, and on top of that, the formative years when you are in, in grade school sets the stage for how successful you're going to be in life. So when there is adequate enough funding for these students, what that means is that they may be adequate enough in their career projection throughout their life. So any sorts of caps on spending that we do for these students now is a cap on their future. It's a cap on breaking generational poverty. And I get it, this is difficult stuff. But to me, if we're not going to full, not even just fully fund, if we're not going to do even more funding than what we already had for these students, then when we say that East Hampton is a welcoming community, we're virtue signaling because it means that everybody in the student population at our schools gets everything that they need as long as they're white first. And I don't subscribe to that. This is a really painful thing for me to have to vote on because I know how much is on the line when it comes to the budget. What are we doing? I mean, I, we can't do this. This is, it, to me, it feels wrong. We shouldn't have to get to the end of the budget process and say, well, if we can come together after the fact, we can probably try to find some money for these students, right? That's not good enough for me. So I have a master's in education. Connie, uh, Councillor Denham, has a PhD in education. Councillor Rist spent his entire career in higher education. Councillor Derby is a public education teacher. Council President Gomez's wife is an educator. Councillor Kwasinski, your wife literally is on the chair of the school committee. Um, Councillor Zaret's wife, an academic. Councillor Peak works in higher education, and Councillor Minyer's mother was probably one of your teachers when you grew up in East Hampton. So I, I guess I just don't understand how we can reconcile 
that some elements of our education are good enough for some students and, and not for others when every single one of us are educators or have family members who are educators. <clears throat> I don't know. It, it, it makes me feel really gross to have to vote on this. And I, I, with total respect for everybody else in the school system, I know that I've put myself out there. I know that I've advocated for you. I am always gonna be on the side of the schools but I, I have to vote no on this. And the reason for that is if we're not going to provide a foundation for all of our students that is the same as every other student, that's not good enough for me. Um, I'll do whatever I need after the fact to make sure that this funding happens because I don't think that my speech or your speech, Councillor Gomez, or your speech, Councillor Denham, is probably going to change the outcome of the vote. I think we're going to go into tomorrow knowing that these students may or may not have the adequate resources that they need. I'm going to dedicate any efforts to make sure that that happens, but I'm not saying yes to this because I, I don't agree with the premise to begin with. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor. Any other Councilor? Councilor Derby. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. President. Um, I, I don't have a long speech prepared. and. And I just want to, as someone who lives this on a daily basis as a public school teacher, I want to just recognize the fact that <clears throat> in the last year, I've gotten six new high school students that don't speak any English. Um, and that's just in, uh, that's literally this past semester. That doesn't even include the fall semester. Um, so as we look at you know, looking at the upper levels of education, we have to understand that there are kids that are coming to us at all ages, not just young kids that are coming to us that are vulnerable. We're getting a lot of high school age kids who have never learned English and learning English as a high school student is not as easy as it is to learn English as an elementary school student. So I, I just don't want to, um, for people to think that elementary school is the only place where this is going to be important and you know um, I have to live every day trying to communicate with students that don't speak English um, and you know it does you know one thing Councilor Riley said triggered a thought in my head which is there's just not enough money for education and the way our funding st structures are set you know we have students that are falling through the gaps in almost every area um, you know ELL is one of them but mental health you know, our core subjects, um, you know, the physical education and, and the electives, I mean, none of them have enough money. And so I think that we have to, you know, recognize that as a, as a global issue of our education system. It's not just one little piece that doesn't have, like none of it has enough money. Um, and so you know, I, I think that is, it might sound overwhelming, but it's it's something that we all have to grapple with because the funding structure for our, the way we fund education is broken. Mm -hmm. and, and we need to acknowledge that. And um, and I think that's important for us to say here, I will vote for this, but I, I really hope that we don't neglect those older kids who need ELL services. Thank you, Councilor Derby. Any other Councilor? Councilor Rist? Thank you, Mr. President. Originally, I was fearful that we were going to hold the school department budget hostage for this program and I didn't like it but now that I've heard everything I want to say that school committee probably doesn't like the fact that we are getting into the weeds of their programming but that's what the budget process gives us the leverage to do and I agree with all the counselors tonight except I don't think I could vote no to a budget that the consequence would be to lay off a lot of teachers and not have our own student, all the students be prepared. But we've put a spotlight on a program because we brought it up at the budget process and we demanded, the finance committee wouldn't vote on this because we demanded that there be a negotiation. And Council, uh, President Gomez and Councilor Denham negotiated. And I believe that the school committee will make a good faith effort to solve this problem. If they need financing in the future, at the end of the school year, for salaries to cover the, the, the teachers that they have to uh, put into this program, they can come back to us and they've done that once. And I trust their, budget, their uh, business manager and that can happen. If they come to us for funds and nothing's happened in this program, that's when we can say no. 
To say no to the entire budget, though, is, is really difficult for me because the consequences far, far outreached anything else. If there's no budget in place on Jan Janu July 1, a bunch of teachers don't get paid. And I don't think that's fair to them because they're the ones who brought it up to us in the first place. Mm -hmm. So I respectfully disagree with Councilor Riley's no, but I do agree that this is the time to put a spotlight on any program in the school system, even though we're not elected to get into the weeds. We are the leaders of this community. And when we hear things, we need to speak out. And the budget process is when to do that, especially when we're voting on $18 million for schools. I'm hopeful they can deal with this. I've heard good things from the school committee and the negotiations. And I just want to say that I think we can, this council should use the budget process. When something comes up, not just in the school department, but something that concerns the full council, that's when you speak to it. It is the mayor's budget. The mayor makes the appropriations. But we have the power to cut and we have power to say no to supplemental appropriations in the future. So we have to keep our eye on this program and see what happens. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, Councilor Rist. Any other councilors? Seeing, he already talked. Seeing none, um, I just want to make last comment before we vote. And the last comment is for the community, to the school committee, to the um, superintendent, for the future superintendent, to the mayor, you can tell based on what the counselors talked tonight, education is really important for us. It is really important, especially for the kids that need most help. Today was clear. Not just the school committee care about the schools and the programs and the teachers and the students, we care too. And I wanna make that clear. We we are really, really concerned, and that's why we bring this forward. Mr. President? She already talked. I'd like to just point out that she is trying, that uh, Megan Harvey is trying to talk at this time. No, it's a, it's a public and hearing. I think you, sh you should address and acknowledge that she ha is trying to talk and explain why. I will, um, def I, I will allow her to talk, uh, and thank you. But I, I just want to make uh, this clear to you. In a, in a public hearing, when we give the opportunity to people to talk, we give the opportunity to talk, and then we don't allow the person to talk again. Um, I know Megan is a school committee member. I don't want this process to go back and forth because we already discussed it at the public safety, uh, the, uh, the finance committee with the, with them. And I'm, I'm concerned that that's where we're going. Um, I will allow her to talk because I'm, I'm okay with it, but I, I'm concerned that we, are, we, we already went through that process, right? I, I, I understand. I wasn't asking that you change the process. I just wanted to acknowledge and to explain to the public your, your, your decision. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Megan, we'll give you a minute. No back and forth here. Thank you. I just wanted to say I appreciate all of your comments so much. And um, I can speak for the school committee and for the administrators that we do not disagree. The school committee does not not like that the, the city council is involved in, in looking at these programs. This was already scheduled. So we are as concerned, as invested as every one of you. We hear you, we hear our constituents. This was before the meeting, before there were concerns in a meeting before between city council and school committee. This was already scheduled for school committee. And I, I don't say that to be adversarial. I say that to just confirm for everyone who is watching that our administrators are not satisfied with cutting services. They do not want to do that. The school committee is not satisfied with that. The school committee is not satisfied with sending a message that people are not welcome here. We hear you. We agree. We are putting this on the schedule. We are working on it. Um, and it is a, a true, we are grateful to be in the place where we are talking about getting appropriations and adding more funding. We have worked with negative amounts of growth in the past years. Um, and this is just, it's really wonderful. We care so much about education in the city. It's becoming more and more obvious. Um, and I'm looking forward to another year of working closely with the administrators and with you on these concerns. We agree with you. This is not 
uh, an adversarial thing. We are working on this. It's just that we, as you have all seen, we have to do it in the public. It has to be in a public meeting and the public meeting is scheduled uh, for whatever date it's scheduled. I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me, but it's the, the June or the July uh, school council meeting. It has to be public. So it will be there. Please come, please join us. Please talk about it. Um, thank you. We're concerned too. We will, we will do what we need to do for these kids. We always do that. Thank you. Thank you, Megan. I just want to be clear again. I think all the counselors, we recognize the uh, hard work for the administrators. Mm -hmm. I hear that from Councilor Riley. I hear that from Councilor Denham. I say that a couple times. We recognize how hard it is to work in a budget. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't want to go back and forth with, with, with what Megan just said, but I just want to clarify that we all do recognize the hard work that the administrators are, are doing. So that that's clear for us. And it's clear the that the teachers have a job to do and they have a concern and that's why why we sit down with them. We don't wait until you like to sit down. We sit down right away. Um, any other counselors before we take, I take a motion? You know, because of the rest. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of 18 million eight hundred and thirty three thousand four hundred and seventy six cents for the various departments listed under section three schools and that the amount listed in the mayor's printed report unless amended be considered specific appropriations as recommended by the mayor. Second. I have a motion and a second for the section three schools uh, for the amount of 18,833,400 with 76 cents. Any further discussion? Say no for those who are in favor. Aye. Uh, any against, abstention? See none. Abstain. One abstain. Motion passes. <clears throat> Council arrest. So, that's a hard act to follow. Uh, Public Works. Public Works, they do a fantastic job for our city. Just, just what they've done during our snow and ice is amazing. Uh, most increases in this budget are due, again, to pay plan and union negotiated increases. Overtime in the highway department is, was a spotlight that we found, and that's mostly due to snow and ice removal. Fuel costs are up some $4,000 due to the vol volatility of fuel costs and the DPW fuels all of the vehicles that the city owns. Um, I have nothing else, uh, and I noticed that Director Nodelman is here if you have any questions, but they do a fantastic job and the budget is appropriate and the Finance Committee voted three to zero to move it forward. Any councilor have any questions or comment about the public works? Uh, go through them. Yeah, I just want to say something. I had the I had the privilege of 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 uh, going with Director Nuttleman this this year to visit the um, water treatment plant and the and the water department. And I just want to say the really the the incredible job that these individuals and city employees do to. Um, what they do to keep the city safe and healthy in terms of uh, monitoring water and, and water treatment, et cetera. And so I, I know that these jobs have a, take a toll on them with their own personal health. Um, and so at some point in the future, I would hope that you know we do a really great job of offering incentives to other uh, uh, in, in, in collective bargaining and union, and I hope that that is something that we would consider for these individuals because the the personal health, the toll that it takes on them personally, I think is significant, and I think it warrants. Um, an examination of that because I, I, I think I think they have there's lasting consequences to what they endure to keep the rest of this community safe. So I just want to put that out there. Thank you, Councillor. Any other councillor? Seeing none. Anyone from the public or uh, Greg? I don't know if you want to add something. No. Anyone from the public? You have any questions or comment about this budget section? None, Councilor Rist. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $2,081,954.91 
for the various departments listed under Section 4, Public Works, and that the amount listed in the Mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations, with the following amounts to be transferred as recommended by the Mayor. Water and Sewer Enterprise, $522,600.08. Sale of Lots, $2,500. ARPA funds $12,612.60. Second. I have a motion and a second for the Section 4 Public Works of the amount of $2,081,954.91. Any further discussion? See none. For those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstention? See none. Motion passes. Cause of arrest. Human Services. This is the Health Department, the Council on Aging, and Veteran Services. We have an expanded service in the health department. We have a new health director being sought, and that expanded service includes a new community social worker who works constantly, is very active in our community, and is a welcome position. It is currently being funded by ARPA pandemic funds, and the mayor is hoping that opioid lawsuit funds will fund it in the future. This position is also working with the mental health clinicians in the public safety sector, and uh, I believe it's, it's long overdue that we have more mental health assistance for our residents. Um, the Council on Aging is reorganizing with now nine positions, including a principal clerk, outreach coordinator, and events coordinator. And the Council on Aging is now in full-time operation post-pandemic limits. Our senior citizens had to wait until this year to get the services that they so very need uh, when they're stuck indoors. Our veteran services are no longer a part of a district. We used to be a district with other communities. It is now a part-time fully benefited house position, in-house position in the, in the city. And we are hope to increase that, the mayor's hope to increase it to full-time by the end of the fiscal year. So veteran services is now fully part of the city and is not you know, it doesn't have to bounce around to other communities. That's about all I have with regard to the highlights for human services. Any council have any questions or comments about human services? Seeing none, anyone for the public have any comments or questions about human services? Seeing none, council arrest. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $923,315.46 for the various departments listed under Section 5 Human Services, and then the amounts listed in the Mayor's printed report unless amended be considered specific appropriations, with the following amounts to be transferred as recommended by the Mayor. ARPA funds, $85,155.20. COA Formula Grant, $27,543.69. Second. I have a motion and a second for the Section 5 Human Services of the amount of 923000 315 with 45 cents. Any further discussion? See none. Those in favor? Aye. 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 Abstention? Against? None. Motion passes. It's an arrest. Culture and Recreation. Uh, here we have the, the library and the parks and recreation department. The library budget increased 10%, far higher than the 3% for other departments uh, in, with regard to expenses, but that's also for personnel. The department's budget, the library budget is $20,000 more than required by the state. And along with our over $500,000 grant we recently gave to the library, it is hoped by the mayor and the city council that it eventually will be able to be self-sustainable. The parks department increases are mostly due to pay plan increases and the recreation temp positions have increased stipends, especially to help recruit lifeguards, which I hope they're successful with. That's all I have for human culture and recreation, Mr. President. Any councilor have any questions or comments about culture and recreations? Councilor Sarit. I mean, as everyone here knows, we have this ongoing conversation about supporting the library. And the first thing I just want to say is how grateful I am that those that make the decisions at the top listened and made a very reasonable increase to that line item this year. Um, this particular section, I, I make notice of two things. One is that um, these items, these services, these departments, um, they are some of the more out, most outfacing items in the city. When you look at recreation, our parks, the services they perform, 
um, cult the cultural events that people have been coming to East Hampton for to visit and identifying with the cultural explosion of the city and then uh, the information and the services that the library provides. Those are three main big topics. You know, we talk all the time about, well, why can't we expand and put this kind of amenity in the park or expand a park or do this? Well, look at this line item. $720,000 for three big things. Never mind the fact that our parks and rec department probably deserves way more money and they do an amazing job with what they have. Um, and I know it's difficult. Money doesn't grow on trees, at least not that I'm aware of. Um, but I, I am grateful for the work that they do, but we have to keep trying to figure out. I'm glad that we figured out how to um, appropriate a little bit more money to the library, but we really have to keep thinking about the cultural events we're putting on and our parks and recreation because this it's, it's just not enough. And when we talk about things like better upkeep at the park, lifeguards, pool, we're building, we're, we want to build, rebuild, the, rebuild the pool. We don't have even services necessarily to support that. We want to put in a dog park. We want to put in a skate park. We need people to actually service these things. It doesn't happen on its own. Um, we need to just think about, and, and that not to take away from some of the very important topics that we talked about before, which my colleagues did a very good job representing, so there was no need for me to speak there. But we, we just have to think about with some of the outward facing services that we're offering the city, how much we want to invest in that to be able to make them viable, sustainable, um, and be able to make them um, expand. That's all. Thank you. Any other concern? Anyone from the public? you please state your name and another for the record? Yes, um, my name is Katya Shapiro. I'm in River Valley Way in East Hampton. I'm also the director of the library. And um, I came here tonight to kind of, partly to thank the council and the city administration for taking our stated concerns so seriously and for really stepping up to try to bring the library more into the city operations and working so closely with us and planning to continue to working so closely with us as we work toward getting state funding for a new building and being able to expand our services. So I came here to, in some ways, to talk about dry budget things, but I've been listening all, all evening to discussions of public safety, discussions of education, discussions of public works, and the way that this whole city works together. And I think you all know, based on your responses, that the library has things to offer in each of these categories. And one of the things that has tied our hands behind our back is that we haven't been able to work with other departments as fully as we want to. And so it's more than just money. City investment in the library and the ways that this library as a private nonprofit that contracts with the city, the ways that the city and city powers that be have worked to change our relationship and to expand it means that I see a future for us being able to collaborate more closely with the schools, with, with um, other cultural organizations, with public works, even with everyone really. You know, we're where people come when they want to have a public hearing, we're where people come when they want to access translation resources where where people come when they want to supplement educational needs or research needs or to find out about the history of this city and the ways in which the city council and the mayor and all of the people working for the city I know I just want to especially mention the treasurer and the auditor who have worked so carefully with us and are going to continue to do so um, really makes that possible and so we're really looking forward to the expansion of services that we have been trying to put forward. We're, we've started already. We, and I also want to thank Councillor Rist for pointing out that a lot of our expanded costs are personnel. We're bringing, our, we're bringing our personnel, much like the rest of the city, up to the levels that are comparable around the state. And that's really, really important to us for both, you know, basic, mm -hmm. <laughs> basically as an employer, but also to be able to recruit and retain the people who can provide these 
public facing services. So I am really thankful for the investment of the council and I hope that we can continue working together to really make the library a part of this really intricate process. So I, I'm really grateful about that. Thank you. My name is Lori Ingraham I'm from 22 Picard Circle and I am the vice president on the Public Library Association. You've heard a lot from Elizabeth Applequest. She's actually traveling tonight. So I am here to say thank you so much for supporting us. Thank you to the mayor. Thank you to the finance committee. And thank you, for, thank you to all of you for uh, listening to us and for putting in a higher budget request for us. This will allow us to not have to take so much out of our endowment and to be able to run the library as well as working on this exciting new phase of the library to get grants and to run a capital campaign to be able to move into a new spot. So we just want to thank, say thank you so much. Thank you. Hey, and I'm Chuck McCullough, 42 Ashley Circle. And uh, it's been my privilege to be able to work with the library board over the last two years as an advisor of sorts. And uh, I just want to again say thank you to the uh, city council and to the mayor for the uh, consideration and the thoughts that you've given and obviously the increased funding that's reflected in this budget to support the library. Um, I think the collaboration between the city and the board of the library has been truly uh, gratifying as we try to take steps to first, as I've said, to stabilize the budget and then be able to move ahead with what I consider to be some really important steps to make sure the library is going to be uh, in East Hampton in perpetuity. Uh, the cannabis funding was a remarkably great first step and I think was in, in addition to this funding that we're speaking to tonight, will stabilize the budget so that the library board can now do the other work that's going to be really important. And some of that other work I just want to outline to the board so you can know what this is going to allow us to do with the library. First, obviously balancing the budget with the cannabis funding and this additional funding that's coming from the budget will allow us to balance the budget for a number of the upcoming years. Then what it allows us to do with that balanced budget then is to pursue the commitment from Bank ESB, which is going to gift uh, a building to the library, which we can then consider as a possible new facility uh, that we are going to start using as a satellite facility to start with. Uh, what it will allow us to do as well is to borrow some money so we can renovate, at least initially, that space to start using it as that satellite facility and help expand services in the library. Uh, the other part that I think is really important to note is that it now will allow the library board to, uh, as part of the bud balanced budget, to hire a, uh, somebody who is going to be able to start to do professional fundraising and start to do the work that's going to be really necessary to keep the, the budget uh, in, a, in, in a balanced nature well beyond uh, the time uh, the cannabis funding is no longer uh, in place. I think that's an incredibly important element here. And then the last part is just to be able, to, with those balanced budgets, we are now able to go to the state and reflect what is going to be really important, which is going to be able to start to look at significant funding for uh, what would be considered larger renovations and improvements for a facility that we all want for the city. So uh, with that, again, I want to just say it, in my two years in working with the library, it's been uh, incredibly uh, gratifying, again, to work with the city council and the mayor in pointing out what's necessary to make this work, but also uh, seeing the response that's come from this group. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good evening, everybody. My name is Colleen Byrne. I live at 27 Colonial Avenue. I'm here as a member of the public and a user of the library. And I want to tell you, it has so much to offer. If you want to do things for the people who are struggling in this town, the young mothers can bring their kids to story time. 
the older kids can go to Lego building. The um, adults and teens have book clubs. I have, I was saved during the pandemic by the book club. I mean, that was a lifeline to me. And people don't often know this, but you can stream books, audio books, or download books on your iPhone or your tablet. I would say I read two more books, read two more books while I do my walking now every month. Um, they also have streaming videos and streaming documentaries and so much more. I want to be brief. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you. Anyone else? Caroline? Yes. Hello. Yes, there I am. Um, yes, I'm Carolyn Cushing, Main Street. I also am the Poet Laureate of East Hampton. Um, so I'm grateful to East Hampton for nurturing the arts, for nurturing me in that role. And um, of course, it's very important that we have a library that um, builds on and expands this kind of arts and literary work that has made East Hampton kind of what it is today. I'm very glad and I'm grateful to the library board for all of their work in creating good plans and bringing them to the city council and to the mayor and to hear uh, about this collaboration and the uh, advancement of funding. Um, I'm grateful to hear that and I really hope that this and would support that this is uh, be the beginning and an ongoing relationship and that the city really invests because the library, investing in the library, it's investing in the people. It's investing in the people who come for services. Everyone can come for services and get books from all different perspectives, different languages as well. And, um, you know, there's a talk of we have finite resources and of course, how we allocate those resources show our priorities. And um, so I appreciate the money going to the library, to the schools. The English as a second language program sounds so important. So uh, thank you all for supporting the library and uh, let's keep this collaboration going forward. And soon when there's a new building, we can actually host events funded by you know, Massachusetts Cultural Council because the building will be accessible right now. You know, to have my swearing in as Poet Laureate, the building was not accessible. We couldn't have had it at the library because of um, the demands, the right demands of our, our funding uh, coming from Massachusetts Cultural Council. So thank you, thank you all so much. Thank you. Hi, I'm Barbara Eaton and I live at 33 Tory Street and I'm just a resident and I wanted to say thank you very much because I, the library was a great way to survive during the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just want you to know that uh, some of us who are just residents really like it. And thank you again for putting out the funds to keep it going. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Say none. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of $720,774 for the various departments listed under Section 6, Culture and Recreation, and that the amounts listed in the Mayor's printed report unless amended be considered specific appropriations as recommended by the Mayor. Second. I have a motion and a second for Section 6, Culture and Recreation, for the amount of 720000 $774. Any further discussion? Seeing none, for those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstentions? <clears throat> Motion passes. Consider the rest. Section 7 is debt and interest. We do have to pay our debts. We can't print money. Um, and uh, this is the section that does that. I want to give the uh, team, uh, especially our treasurer, kudos for reducing our short term, by using short term bonding to pay for the Mountain View remaining borrowing helps us uh, move forward without a major increase in taxation because we still owe uh, money on that bond. And we bonded, I think, 60 million, and there was still like 10 million left to bond. And uh, the treasurer was able to do this uh, in, a, in a very good way for us. 
So thank you to the whole, to the Treasury Department and, and all of our financial team. Uh, not much to say here except uh, we kind of have to pay you this. Councilor, okay. <laughs> have any questions or comments? Anyone from the public have any questions or comment? Seeing none, because the rest. I move the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of four million eight hundred twenty-four thousand four hundred thirty-three dollars and thirty-seven cents for the various departments listed under Section Seven, debt and interest, and that the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations, with the following amounts to be transferred or raised as recommended by the mayor. Water and sewer enterprise, $301,784.37. Debt exclusion taxation to be reduced by reserves for amortization, $3,310. Tax rate stabilization, $400,000. Second. I have a motion and a second for section seven debt and interest of the amount of $4,824,400. And thirty-three dollars with thirty-seven cents. Any further discussion? Say no. For those one in favor. Aye. Aye. Anyone abstain? Against? Motion passes. Section eight is unclassified, or better known as employee benefits. This is where we pay the cost for all of our insurances, our retirement, uh, our workers' comp, etc. For all departments, including the school department. The cost of health insurance has gone up considerably this year. I think it's something like nine percent. We do have a very good health uh, insurance program, and we use it uh, for all of our employees, um, as well as our retirees. It is one of the most attractive parts of employment in the city. So it is a good thing, even though we have to raise it, uh, premiums go up for it. Premiums didn't go up in the past few years, but they caught up to us. Um, I want to say, personally, that if we only have 2.5% increase in property taxes, we're relying on the good graces of state aid and other grants to help us fund things like 9% increases in health insurance. So the math uh, doesn't work from just property taxes. But anyway, uh, th these are our benefits that we give our well-deserved benefits for our employees. Any consular have any questions or comments? You know, anyone for the public have any questions or comments about section eight? Seeing on wrist. Oops, sorry. Turn the page. I move that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of ten million eight hundred ninety-four thousand one hundred fourteen dollars and nine cents for the various departments listed under Section Eight Employee Benefits, and the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations, with the following amounts to be transferred as recommended by the mayor and the finance committee: Water Sewer Enterprise, six hundred forty-six thousand. $863.77. Second. I have a motion and a second for Section 8 on classified employees' benefits for the amount of $10,894,114.09. Any further discussion? Seeing no, for the one, those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstentions? Seeing none, uh, motion passes. Council arrest. Community Preservation Act is a separate budget. It also shows the revenue that comes in from a 3% uh, tax on our property taxes as well as state match. It has gone up considerably. The revenue is divided uh, as per law um, to three areas distributed to the mandated three set-aside accounts with 120000 each for historic preservation, affordable housing, and open space and recreation. Um, also, 250000 has been set aside for the old town hall project in order to reduce potential bonding already approved by the council. Whenever that project reaches its uh, conclusion, we will have to bond. So if we don't have to bond as much, we're saving the city considerable interest. Uh, anyway, if, if yeah, I am the chair of the CPA, if anybody has any questions as well. I think any council have any questions or comments? Seeing none, anyone from the public? Have any questions or comments? Seeing none, consider arrest. I move the city that the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of eight hundred and thirty thousand dollars for the various departments listed under Section Nine Community Preservation, and that the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations with the total amount to be raised and appropriated from from the Community Pre Preservation Fund as recommended by the Mayor and the City Council Finance Committee. Second. 
I have a motion and a second for section nine, community preservation of the amount of $830,000. Any further discussion? Seeing none, for those one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstention? Seeing none, motion passes. That's the rest. Uh, the last section is the enterprise section, which is the accounts are for, for the user paid business of water and sewer work. Um, as you all know, we have major infrastructure improvements necessary for our water and sewer and our department head, Greg Nelliman and his team have worked very hard, especially at the wastewater treatment plant to keep up with the kinds of very old infrastructure that we are replacing slowly but surely. Salary increases in the budget are due to collective bargaining. And one of the major costs that's increased is the cost of wastewater chemicals, which has increased substantially. Um, there is a pending sewer and water rate increase. That is because this infrastructure repair is quite costly. And unfortunately, rate payers are gonna have to foot the bill for this in the future, but it has been set aside over three years, so it won't hit our rate payers that hard. If anybody has any questions, our DPW director is still here. Thank you. Any counselors? You have any questions or comments? Anyone from the public? Have any questions or comments? Seeing none, counselor rest. I move the city vote to raise and appropriate the sum of two million nine hundred thirty-nine thousand seven hundred seventeen dollars for the various departments listed under Section 10 Enterprise, and that the amounts listed in the mayor's printed report, unless amended, be considered specific appropriations with the following amounts to be transferred as recommended by the mayor and the city Fi council finance committee, water and sewer enterprise, $2,939,717. Second. I have a motion and a second for section 10 enterprise of the amount of $2,939,717. Any further discussion? Seeing none, those are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstention? Motion passes. Mr. President, I have one more motion I need to make. Council arrest. Uh, we have a revolving fund cap that we have to move every year for the electric vehicle charging stations. Um, it's a, it's a $20,000 revolving fund for the DPW that we have to set up every uh, budget year. I move that the city council cap the DPW revolving fund spending for electric vehicle charging stations and the bike share programs at $20,000 for fiscal year 2024 as per Mass General Law section 40, I mean, chapter 44, section 53E and one half. Second. I have a motion and a second for the revolving fund cap of for $20,000 for the fiscal year 2024. Any further discussion? Seeing none, uh, those are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against, abstention? Motion passes. And that was my last budget. And that's concluded. Yes. Uh, budget pass. Thank you for everybody. Uh, we have uh, Councillor uh, Derby. Uh -huh. Thank you, Mr. President. Um, so the first item that we have is uh, uh, to amend Chapter 7, Article 1, uh, by adding Section 7-6, the Civilian Traffic Control Officer. And this is something that I'm going to request that we uh, continue the public hearing until our next meeting on the 21st. Uh, and I would like to do that in the form of a motion. Oh, no, no let's to. get some public input first. Is, is anyone, thank you, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> is, anyone, is anyone here, they have any questions, comments about the civilian traffic control officers? Say none, Consul Derby. So that, that was my anticipation. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I'd like to move that we continue that um, until our next meeting, uh, uh, June 21st. Uh, Say 15. Second. We I have a motion and a second to, to continue in the public hearing of the amend of the Article 1 by adding sec uh, new section 7 6 to June 21st at 6 15 in the chambers. Any further discussion? Uh, Councilor Sarat. Uh, is there just do you just have to work on the language a little bit? What's, I just wanted to understand what the, the request is for. The, the police chief is really involved with this, and he still need a few more information about some meetings that he have that we, he want to add to the uh, the police hearing, and he, is, he don't have that information today. Mm -hmm. He requests if we can move it for the next meeting, that way he can bring some extra information for the benefit of, of the counselors and the, of the community why we need this. 
uh, to approve this. Well, it makes sense. As a lawyer, uh, rest. <laughs> um, just a thought. Maybe we should move this to the July meeting only because Barbara's not here. I don't think it needs to be re-advertised because it's advertised already. But if there is significant changes that maybe you make between now and then, you might have to. No changes? Okay. But I just thought, I don't know if we have to re-advertise. I don't think we do uh, because and, it was advertised. And the police chief says, I guess, June 21st will be okay. Okay. Yeah. Uh, any other counselors? No. Uh, for those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstention? Motion passes. Okay. So, uh, the next item we have is also to amend Chapter 7. Uh, and this is to amend Article 2, Classification Play Plan, Section 7-17, uh, Exhibit A, by adding the position of data collector uh, at grade C. And this is in uh, the assessor's uh, department. And um, I believe that we're leaving money on the table by not having this position filled. Uh, and I know that we have Christine. some of the Christine. They could speak to this if, if anybody would like to hear more. I do, I, if Emily is on the call, I would love to, there is one question I just wanted to clarify before we move this. Um, I, there was discussion about this being at grade D. I believe that we clarified that it was at grade C, but I just want to make sure, I think it was, there was in the original paperwork, it was, there was, there was like a little bit of a, so I just want to make sure that we have the right grade um, and so that that's the only question I really have, uh, and I don't know if Emily. She, she's, I mean, she's on the yeah, call. Yeah, here. Um, let me try to look it up for you really quick. Sorry, I got to look back. That's fine. My paperwork, data collector. <sighs> Emily, while you're looking for that, I think it's really important yes. to hear from Christine why this is really important for the assessor's office. And she's been here all afternoon. I, I, think, I think she deserved to talk a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> she wants to, I think that's the question. She wants it. That's what she's here. <laughs> Sell it. <laughs> Was there any questions first? Did anybody have any questions? Any questions? Any questions about the data code? It says great seat. So um, bringing a data collector in the office will help with um, also new growth, which we need to help with the budget. Mm -hmm. um, we want to make sure all our property cards are correct. Um, we don't have mistakes on them. Having a data collector in the office also, if appointments need to be made, the person can work mornings, afternoons. Right now we um, pay a company to do it. And each inspection is $22. So that's even if the, the person goes out and goes, yep, the pool's there, $22. We also have to do probably six, $700, I mean, six or 700 inspections a year. We have over 6,000 properties. So the DOR, the state makes us go out and do 10%, um, which isn't always the easiest. There's some properties that haven't been inspected in 10 years. Mm -hmm. So we would need to do six or seven every year up to 10 years, and then you've got to start all over again. So by having someone in the office, it's easy to set these up. Normally you would give the data collector certain streets to go out to look at, and they might have to go back to inspect. With the company, they just come out, pick the days they want to come out, and that's the end of it. And then having someone in the office too, when people come in, they can talk to them about the inspections mm. with, the, obviously, the um, assessor. Normally, the assessor would go out and do all new homes where the data collector would do ones that are already there. Thank you. Any counselor have any questions to Christine? Thank you, Christine. Emily, you have the answer? Yes, I do. So we did the grade C. Um, and we did that because this position doesn't require, like, any kind of bachelor's degree or associate's degree, and it doesn't have like a high level of supervisory or anything like that. So it's a pretty, I don't wanna say an entry level position, but it's something that we could have someone who just has a basic understanding of real estate or um, housing development or whatever come into and take it on pretty easily. So, and they'd be working 
um, alongside the assessor, so they'd be getting a lot of knowledge and growth from them. Perfect. Thank you, Emily. Thank you. Any counselor have any questions or comments? Anyone from the public have any questions or comments about this public hearing? No, Councilor Derby. Thank you, Mr. President. I move to amend Chapter 7, Personnel, Section 7-17A, Exhibit A, Classification of Employees by adding the position of data collector at Grade C. Second. I have a motion and a second to amend Article 2nd, Classification of Pay Plan, Section 7-17A, by adding the position of data collector at a great C. Any further discussion? Any none? For those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstain? Against? Motion passes. Motion. We'll take a motion to close the public hearing. Second. I have a motion and a second to close the hearing. Any further discussion? Any none? Um, for those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstain? Motion passes. Go back to where in the business. I will. We have a resolution that we have a request for immediate consolidation. Consolidate them. Um, so this is a uh, motion, a resolution um, to support the Thrive Act, which would um, it's. Uh, in regards to Massachusetts State Legislature that is considering <laughs> Bill H-495 and Senate Bill 246, uh, an act empowering students and schools to thrive, which is known as the Thrive Act. So essentially this um, um, resolution is in support of um, and the use of MCAS scores as graduation requirements. Um, as well as changing process of receivership, ending pieces of that, et cetera. And so this is uh, an opportunity to um, support our students, um, particularly um, students of color and low income students um, because MCAS scores, um, actually uh, have a, one, they have a negative impact on their educational experience, and it also, um, it, they don't confirm anything, right, in terms of student outcome, uh, and not just students of color and low-income students, but also students with um, individual learning plans, you know, et cetera, and so we know that high stakes testing uh, puts incredible limitations on the success of, of students in schools. And so this is a resolution that would, uh, in, in support of this um, legislation. So. Thank you, Councilor Denham. Any other councilors? Councilor Sarrett. I just wanted to bring, thank the councilors for bringing this forward. Um, it's very apropos given uh, the conversation we just had earlier in the budget discussion. Um, I think that uh, the state of education and the standards that are set in the state in our commonwealth are woefully misguided and teach a, we need to we need to teach to the students and ensure their success, not teach to a test. And especially I appreciate how much vocal uh, the vocal voices of my colleagues, especially speaking for the marginalized, um, and those who do not enjoy the entitlements of being able to seek extra support or being entitled to extra support to pave their way for education or simply be have doors open for them just because of their socioeconomic status. Um, and so by supporting legislation like this, we're supporting our students, all of our students. Um, and I, I appreciate your both bringing this forward. Thank you, Councilor Sorry, Councilor Derby. I, I I can't support this enough. Um, you know, we have lost so much uh, over the time that we have sold out <clears throat> our priorities to private companies uh, to assess our students 
uh, in homogenized ways. Uh, we've lost creativity. We've lost great teachers. We've lost uh, critical thinking. And, you know, it's, it's time to ditch the test. And it's time to start teaching to the whole child, uh, to the whole person, to start creating people that are prepared to do the work that we need them to do to survive on this planet that we have brought to the state that we've brought it to. And our educational system is failing those kids right now by not giving them the tools that they need to, to thrive. And I think if you look at our students' mental health and social emotional affect, it, it, it is all impacted by the way that we educate them. And um, I, I'm really glad that this was brought forward. Thank you, Councilor. Councilor Rist? I just want to thank Dr. Denham for bringing this forward. Don't, don't, it, it's not funny. She is a PhD. And we're lucky we have an educator of her quality on this council along with uh, others, as uh, Councilor Riley, because this is the kind of thing that we can bring forward because we bring as counselors the knowledge we have in our fields forward so that people like the school committee, which I hope will support this, listen to us because this is so, so long coming. We need to get rid of teaching to the test. I agree so much with that statement. We need to teach and educate our students so they can get out into the public and not worry about passing a test. Passing a test, and I remember it, is so anxiety driven. It cannot possibly, how do you succeed at that if you're not so used to taking tests? A lot of kids aren't. So I so much thank Dr. Denham for bringing this forward. Thank you. Thank you, Councilor Reese. Any other Councilors? I just want to add, um, I, I want to echo uh, what every single Councilor said about this resolution. Um, it's really important that we stop measuring academics in a way that is not effective. That has to stop. And once again, I just want to say it to the public, to the school committee, to the educators, and to the, the entire Massachusetts, that the city council in Southampton is really concerned and is really into education. We want our kids really well educated, and we don't want a test avoiding or creating stress unnecessary for the kids to pass or graduate. I will end it that way. Um, any other counselors before we take a motion? Councilor Denham. Yeah, I just want to echo everything. I think at the heart of this, I think we need to reimagine what success looks like. Mm -hmm. And I think we need to do everything that we can to support our students. So this is in the form of a motion, um, the East Hampton City Council resolution in support of the Thrive Act. The city of East, oh, oops. Uh, the East Hampton City Council is deeply committed to the success and well-being of all our students. Additionally, we recognize the limitations of high stakes testing and affirm that the nature of the MCAS has a disproportionately negative impact on students of color and economically disadvantaged students. Whereas the Massachusetts State Legislature is considering passage of H495 S246, an act empowering students and schools to thrive, also known as the Thrive Act. And there's locations you can go to read the bills. Whereas the Thrive Act would end the use of MCAS scores as a graduation requirement, and whereas the Thrive Act would establish a new process for identifying and supporting schools designated as in need or comprehensive support and improvement, and whereas the Thrive Act would maintain MCAS assessments and related reporting and accountability requirements to the extent mandated by federal law, and whereas the use of MCAS scores as a graduation requirement has not catalyzed the closing of opportunity gaps in Massachusetts, and the test can be a barrier to graduations for students who do not perform well on standardized tests despite their, under, their understanding of a subject. And whereas the Thrive Act would establish a modified graduation requirement based on coursework rather than high stakes standardized testing and implement a new comprehensive support 
and improvement system designed to empower local communities to give students the tools and resources they need to succeed. And whereas the Thrive Act would establish a commission to study and make recommendations for a more authentic and accurate system for assessing students, schools, and school districts. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the East Hampton City Council supports the resolutions drafted, introduced, and adopted by other cities, localities, and states across the nation that recognize the ineffective and harmful effects that standardized testing has on the learning environment for students and educators. We, there, we further resolved that the East Hampton City Council supports H495 and S246, an act empowering students and schools to thrive, also known as the Thrive Act, and we'll send a copy of this motions to the Senators John Velas, Representative Dan Carey, and Governor Healy. Second. I have a motion and a second to pass a resolution, the Hampton City Council resolution in support of the Thrive Act. Any further discussion? See no. For those who are in favor? Aye. Anyone Aye. against? Abstention? Motion passes. Councilor Derby. Uh, yes, Mr. President. Um, so we have a request to re uh, review traffic mitigation um, at the intersection of Cottage, Chapel, Clark, and Holyoke Streets. And in order to um, send this to public safety where I'd like to send it, I would like to um, request that we suspend uh, Council Rule 7... 5C. Was it? 5C. 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 Well, I looked it up before. I'm not that good. <laughs> yeah. 5C. 5. Which, which basically requires us to have uh, a plan attached to any new business. Um, this is, uh, this particular request doesn't necessarily have a solution to that issue and is hoping to bring the interested parties together to potentially formulate some sort of uh, solution for that intersection, um, which is why there's no concrete um, plan in place. So I would request that we suspend council rule 5C. Second. I have a motion and a second to suspend the rules 5C. Any further discussion? See no. Those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any abstention? Abstain. Against? One abstain. Uh, motion passes. Councilor Derby. Okay, so now I would like to move um, the request review traffic uh, mitigation at the intersection of Cottage Chapel, Clark, and Holyoke Streets to public safety. Before before I take the motion, do you want to move all of the public safety together? Uh, and uh, we can also um, send the request to consider several uh, parking amendments in downtown to public safety as well. Second. We have, I have a motion and a second to send two items to the public safety. Any further discussion? Councilor Sarrett. I appreciate both these items, and I certainly appreciate the tenure and wisdom of my colleague and colleagues who submitted this. I just, <clears throat> I understand the rule was um, suspended. I just, in the spirit of it, though, I want to try to, as the chair of public safety, I want to try to avoid this being a working group as much as possible, so as much information that can be submitted um, for the meeting to discuss whether um, that take the form of conversations with stakeholders such as DVW ahead of time, I would appreciate that. Uh, notwithstanding the fact that certainly happy to have creative discussion during these meetings, but that, that's just a request on my part. Any other counselor? For this one in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against abstention? Motion passes. Okay, uh, and we also have a request to consider zoning waivers and uh, a change of board review under section 11-13. I would move to send that to ordinance committee. Second. I have a motion and a second to send the request to the consider zoning waivers and change of board review under section 11-13. And for the discussion, you know, for those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against, abstentions? Abstain. One abstain, motion pass. Uh, now is Councilor Rist. Yes, I have four financial matters which I will move to Finance Committee and sub public hearing. The first is an interdepartment transfer from the Community Preservation Act. The amount requested is $750,000 to be appropriated from the CPA undesignated fund, $750,000. To be appropriated to the reserve for community housing, $750,000. 
to explicitly set aside funding to be used for affordable housing projects only. The next is a Community Preservation Act Supplemental Appropriation Request. The amount requested is $200,000. To be appropriated from the CPA Reserve for Community Housing, $116,690. And the CPA Undesignated Fund, $83,310 for a total of $200,000 to be appropriated to the Treehouse Support for Affordable Housing, $200,000 for the following purpose, to purchase a 42-year affordable housing restriction on 55 units of affordable housing through support of deep energy retrofit, electrification, and capital needs renovations. I apologize. My fingers aren't working. The next is a supplemental inter-apartment transfer. The amount requested is $52,000. $526.96 to be transferred from the PEG access account, $52,526.96 to be transferred to the PEG access account, $52,526.96 for the following purpose, to give approval to spend from the PEG access receipts reserved account for cable related purposes consistent with the franchise agreement. The last is a supplemental appropriation of $7,795.20 to be transferred from free cash, $7,795.20 to be transferred to the mayor clerical salary, $7,795.20. The amount requested to be used for the following purpose, salary for the EA for the last three periods of fiscal year 23, EA standing for executive assistant. I move that these aforementioned four items be sent to the Finance Committee for review, as well as a public hearing set for these items for 615 on June 21st in these chambers. Second. I have a motion and a second for two appropriations, two transfers, to send it to the Finance Committee and to schedule a public hearing for the June 21st at 615 of the chambers. Any further discussion? Say no. Those who are in favor? Aye. Aye. Any against? Abstention? Motion passes. This body is going to move to a second session. The city council will discuss and as necessary vote to meet in a second session to discuss the possibility of resolution of claim made by the South Hadley Electric like department related relative to work and claims we have performed in the city. And this body is, doing, is not going to reconvene. We're going to adjourn at the uh, second session. But I will take 10 minutes break. And then we can go to the second session at A06. We stay here. No, we go into the room. Thank you, everybody. We can bring the mayor in back. Yeah, the mayor is in the corner. You definitely. Yes, yes. yes. Uh, uh, can you? We need to sign a few things. We should sign. Nicole, things. stay there. I'm going to close a lot of people, and then I will move the computer. Do we move to close the regular session? We okay. Close it there. We, we can, yeah, we can, we'll, we'll, we can we'll close. We'll the executive and then close this. Yes, we, we will adjourn so there. still in, in, in session. Correct. Yeah, but we, I call 10 minutes break. With the recess. Yeah. Do we have something to sign up? So, yes, we have it. Oh, no, that's fine. Oh. Okay. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It doesn't matter. We have to stay anyway. <laughs> Resolution and a gazette. Here, I always give you a pen.